and I welcome you to Sunday School this morning. I welcome those that may be watching online. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity that I've had to <laughs> during this time. It's been a learning experience. Um, I feel like I've had to be a little more creative um, to teach in this type of setting. And I always like a challenge. And so I've enjoyed doing that. And it appears that the next time that I teach, I'll be back in our small class setting. And I just wanted to thank you for that. I've enjoyed being with you all and enjoyed this. It's been different, but I've enjoyed doing it. So if you are looking in your books, you can turn to page 37. And if you're looking in your Bible, you can turn to Luke 19. And that's where we will be this morning. And it is Palm Sunday, a day of celebration. And um, that's what our Sunday School lesson is about. It's about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so early in the week, I was reading this lesson and thinking about the scripture. And as I was doing that, I just get caught up in, okay, what are the prophecies that were fulfilled here? What were the Pharisees and the Jewish people seeing as Jesus came into Jerusalem? Because it's a different thought than we necessarily have from this side of the cross. And they would have seen things and recognized things that we don't necessarily. And I find all of that really interesting because it ties the Old Testament into the New Testament. And if you've read your lesson, you've seen some of that in that. And so my mind was going there, and I was, um, I was thinking about all of those things. And then Wednesday night or early Thursday morning, I guess it was. That'll, is it on? It is. I got you muted. Okay. Um, I, as I've been thinking about that during the week. Then you can adjust it right there. <clears throat> okay he'll get it me on in a minute we'll see if it's working okay that'll help I had a night where for whatever reason I got the worst <coughs> leg cramp and foot cramp that I've ever had in my entire life and you know that when that happens about the only thing you can do is yeah. get up well I got up but it was hurting so bad that I stumbled because of the way that leg felt I hit my head on the door facing, oh and if you were to look real closely, you'll see that it's bruised over there. And then I was wide awake, and you were not going to go back to sleep too quickly, and maybe I had, you know, a little concussion. <laughs> and what stood out to me during the night about this Sunday school was the donkey. And so we are going to look at our lesson today from the perspective of the donkey, for whatever reason, and so we're going with that, whether it was God or whether it was a light concussion, I'm not sure, <laughs> but we're going with the donkey. And actually, it'll, I hope that you enjoy that part of it, of what can we learn from the donkey and the lessons from the donkey, but I think there's some very real truths that are there and some things that I wasn't aware of. Our theme of our lesson, as you look on page 37, is that Jesus is worthy of worship and praise. And the first paragraph there just introduces it so well that I want to read that. God created human beings to worship, namely to worship him. All of scripture points to Jesus Christ as God, which means he is worthy of our worship and praise. Moreover, the testimonies of the gospel give us clear depictions of Jesus as God. But not all people respond to Jesus with worship. Even still, God provides us all we need to worship Jesus. With this truth in mind, the call to worship Jesus, along with the evidence and grace we need to do so, attests to God's goodness in his revelation of Christ as his son. So God is providing all that we need. So thinking about that donkey a little bit, and we're going to see and learn a little bit how the donkey worshiped as well as donkeys can. And I don't think that's too far out of line because if you were to look at the last scripture of the session, it says, it's talking about the Pharisees. And Jesus' response to them was, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. 
Well, if the stones can cry out, the donkey can cry out too. So I think that's true. And also we see in Psalm 96, verses 12 through 13, which is a <coughs> prophecy about Palm Sunday, it says that um, that the fields and and all that are in it will be joyful. <coughs> the trees will rejoice before the Lord. He's coming. And if you think about that, everything in the field could include the donkey, right? So I'm getting you into the donkey being there. And also we see in Isaiah 55, 12, that you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you. And all of the trees of the field will clap their hands. And I'll add, and the donkey will stomp his, his, his hoof. So we're concentrating on that. So what about that donkey in the Bible background? I learned some things there, and, and none of this is original to me. There, um, particularly the BibleAnswer.org had some of this and some other places. So none of it is entirely original to me. I'm just kind of pulling it together. First of all, we know that a donkey would have been used for work and transportation during that time. There's no doubt about that. The donkey also is mentioned around 150 times in the Bible. That's a lot. Um, just for comparison, of course, the sheep, which includes the rams and the lambs and the ewes and all of the different sheep, are mentioned around 500. Obviously, that's going to be true because they were part of the sacrificial system. Um, goats are mentioned 172 times. So our donkey is mentioned about as much as those things were. The bulls are mentioned around 171, and all of those are part of the sacrifices. But here is the donkey that's an unclean animal, according to the scripture, and that donkey is mentioned 150 or so times. So the donkey must be important, and the donkey must have something to teach us, because we know that everything in scripture is there for our teaching and for our edification and for our learning. So, and also as I was looking through those animals, I love dogs. And dogs are mentioned um, about 42 times, not necessarily favorably. And you cat lovers, cats aren't mentioned at all. Okay. Just if you get down to the lowly cat, just the lions are mentioned. So just by numbers, we know then that they must have been important. And they were important for that work and that transportation. They are known to be reliable and faithful animals, that they will, will do what you want them to do as long as it's reasonable. We know that they're strong animals, that they're able to carry a lot, that they were used, um, in, if you look back in Genesis, whenever Joseph went to Egypt, he carried, or whenever his brothers went to Egypt, they took donkeys to carry back the loads of things that they were bringing back. But in Bible times, the donkey was associated with wealth. For us, the donkey's a lowly animal, but that comes a lot from our own history whenever sharecroppers and um, freed slaves and all of that early in our history could afford a donkey, but they couldn't afford a stronger or a bigger animal. And so that comes more from our history. But if you look in the Bible and look back and again, those of you in BSF, I'm going back some to Genesis with this. The donkeys were listed in the list of wealth, that they had so many donkeys as well as they did other animals. They would give them as gifts of peace offerings. So they were known that they were part of a wealth that was associated there. Also, the Bible tells us the donkeys were adaptable. If you look in Job 39, verses 5 through 8, it talks about the donkey and how they adapt to the wilderness and adapt to where they are. We consider them very humble animals, but in Bible times, kings rode donkeys. If you look back in the Old Testament, you will see that they were riding donkeys into cities when they were coming in peace. And in fact, if you looked in 1 Kings one thirty-eight, and that the donkey that the, the people trying to put Solomon into power wanted to put him on David's donkey, on his mule, but on his donkey, 
to show that he was the next king. I never thought about that point. I'd read that scripture, but that was part of the symbolism is that he was riding the king's donkey. And so they have that. One source I read had the humor of saying that it was kind of a royal mule, kind of like Air Force One maybe that most people can't get on. So that sort of thing. And I never realized that donkeys are covered in the Ten Commandments. If you look at the one at Exodus 20, 17, which is the commandment about don't covet, it includes don't covet your neighbor's donkey. It's even covered there. And so we're going to see as we go through, I'm giving you a little of that history because that donkey, the fact that Jesus wanted a donkey to ride in is an important part of that history. And this would have been an important part of what the Jewish people and the people of that day were used to. It wouldn't seem so strange that he chose the donkey. We're the ones that put it that that was just the lowliest of the low animals. It wasn't. It was seen as a royal animal of a king coming in in peace. And to me, that just kind of, when I thought about that, the Prince of Peace came into Jerusalem riding an animal that symbolized kings being at peace. And that just kind of just gave me shivers to think about of, of that fulfillment that was there. And I hope that it means something to you, too. And so we're going to look at other places with that as we go through today's lesson. The first um, section of um, scripture is Luke 19, 29 through 34. If you're following in your book, it's on page 38. And it says, titles it, Obey. We don't necessarily think about that word obey as part of worship. But obedience to God and obedience to Jesus is part of how we worship. If we're not in obedience, we can't really fully worship God. We can't do that well if we're not obeying his ways. And so as we look there in verses 29 through 34, Jesus uh, is speaking as that's the he. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever set. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? The Lord needs it, they said. If we go back to that very beginning of that scripture and the locations that are there, Bethany is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. And that's where Jesus would have raised Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead. So the people, the areas he was passing through, these people would have known of that miracle and many other miracles. And in all likelihood, they began to follow him along the way. That's where part of the crowd came from. The Mount of Olives is a very famous area. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives to pray. Um, it is where he, we believe he ascended into heaven. And because of what the angels say in Acts, we believe it's where he may return whenever he descends again. And so that is a very famous area. But I would encourage you during the week, I can't show you, but I would encourage you to look at a map of Jerusalem and a map of where the Mount of Olives is and the road that he probably was following and its proximity to the temple because they are very close to one another. And he was approaching from the temple side of the city. And I just encourage you, if you like maps, and I like maps, I'd encourage you to kind of look at that and think about that because I think that teaches us something also about Jesus and about his path and his walk during these last days. So he is coming from that area. And he tells the disciples, two of the disciples, to go in and just get this donkey. 
it's going to be tied up and just take it. And I've always wondered if that is, how's that different from stealing, you know? And why would the owners just let that donkey go so easily? Well, again, in my research, I discovered that kings or people in authority had the right to borrow what they needed and return it later. They were trusted. And so if you think about it, they say the Lord, they set Jesus apart as a very important figure there. And so it would have been natural then for the donkey's owner to let the donkey go with them. And that helped me to understand that because I'd always thought, you come to take my car and I'm probably going to question you a little bit more if I don't know you. But I understand now better that that was just an accepted thing, that that was a tradition. You'll also sometimes read that possibly Jesus had already set this up, but I don't think so personally. I think he was showing his deity, his omniscience of knowing exactly where that donkey is going to be, exactly what will be said, exactly what the disciples needed to know in order to obey, in order to do it. He was knowing how that was going to work. And so the disciples simply obeyed. They didn't question him, at least not according to our scripture, and they went and found it all just as he had said. And I think I've read past, or haven't thought about it recently anyway, the fact that Jesus requested an unbroken colt. This donkey he was asking for had never been ridden before. Nobody, nothing had been on its back before. It was there for the purpose of Jesus. It had a sacred purpose ahead of it. And beyond that, we're going to see that that donkey that had never been ridden before tolerated all sorts of obstacles along the way and fulfilled what Jesus had set out for it to do. And to me, that there's a real lesson for us to learn there. <clears throat> and everything happened just as Jesus had said. They found the donkey, they were able to take the donkey, and the words were fulfilled of what he had said. <clears throat> then our next section, in, that is on page 41, is more of what we think of as worship. It goes into the praise part, and that's what I think we tend in our mind, rather than obedience, rather than the fact that when it may not be comfortable, I may not know everything about it, but I simply obey what I know God wants me to do, that that is a way that we worship. So we do worship through obedience, but the praise is more what we automatically think of when we think of worship because that's what we've come here hopefully today you've come here to learn but also that you've come prepared to worship whenever the time comes and so we're going to look at verses 35 through 38 and that's on page 41 if you're looking in your um, book and so the they here is the disciples then they brought it the donkey to Jesus and after throwing their clothes on the colt they helped Jesus get on it. And as he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. So this unbroken donkey is given to Jesus, clothes are thrown on its back. Jesus is helped to get on its back. And this unbroken animal allows all of that to happen. Now, I didn't grow up on a farm. I've never been a horse person. But in movies, I've seen that unbroken animals don't allow those things to happen easily. You usually have to do a lot of teaching. You usually have to do a lot of training. And so, again, why on earth would that donkey? Well, on earth they, he wouldn't. But who was getting on his back? 
Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who had created all things in creation anyway, he had created that donkey, and the donkey obeyed him, and the donkey cooperated. That donkey continued to see the obstacles of things being thrown in front of it, of cloaks and clothes being thrown in front of it. I don't think usually a donkey would just cooperate with all of that, particularly not an untrained donkey. And then the shout started, and the praises started, and the chaos almost started. And that donkey steadfastly carried his creator, into Jerusalem. I liked that. I liked that image that was there of that donkey. It talks about him going down the Mount of Olives. Actually, there would have been about a 200 feet per mile drop. It is going down from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. And what were the people praising him for? They were praising Jesus for the miracles he had worked, for God's work that they had seen done. They call him king, and the echoes of angels, we hear those echoes of his birth, of when he was born. We also see a prophecy fulfilled, because in Zechariah 9, 9, it said, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It was prophesied, and it happened just as the prophecy had said. And in Psalm 118, there is a verse that says, and I'm going to refer to a lot of scripture because to me that's part of the miracle of the Bible is how it all works together. Psalm 118 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. So there's the praise. And if you remember, the angel said at his birth, when they were talking to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. We just hear the echoes of all of those things that have gone before. And so there's that praise that's there for what he had done, for who he was, for all of those things that were there. And all of that indicated... If you think about it, that that prophecy that the king would come into Jerusalem amid praise and worship, riding on a donkey, would have been a direct prophecy that the Pharisees and the other Jews would have recognized as a sign that the Messiah was coming. It's a sign they had been looking for, and it was happening. Now, some people want to accept that. That's true in the story but some totally want to reject it. And that's true today. Some people can see the clear signs of who Jesus is and what he's doing, and some will accept it and some will reject it. And that happens during the, during the days to come, as we know. And so as we look at things like the verses in Luke and the verses in Psalm and the verses in Zechariah, all of those verses, we see scripture calling us to praise. We call, he, the scripture calls us to worship. And so I'm calling you to worship this morning during the worship service. That's what we call it. But sometimes I don't feel like we really come prepared to worship. I think we have to come prepared having thought about who God is and who Jesus is. <laughs> And this morning on Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, we need to think about what our Lord was going through during this week. And we need to be remembering those things so that our hearts and our minds are ready to worship. I know it is easy because it is for, for most of us, as I look around, I think all of us, it's a habit. And it's a good habit. Habits can be good things. It's a habit to get up and go to church, to go to Sunday school, to go to worship. We usually go get pizza after worship. There's a pattern. A lot of times we go for a hike in God's creation on Sunday afternoon whenever the weather's good. We've got patterns and habits of what our Sundays look like. 
And so we've got to overcome the fact that that's just something we always do to bringing back in that worship, that awareness of who God is, of why we really came here this morning. And you've got to prepare your heart for that. And you don't do that whenever I start playing the prelude or when Brady announces the first hymn. You have to prepare for that. Jesus had prepared the disciples and the crowd to worship. He had gotten the donkey. He was riding in, and there was preparation that was there. And so we need to be prepared as well. And maybe it's too late for today. Maybe it's too late to really get ready today. But I encourage you this week to spend some time thinking about why you worship. And you really worship all week long. But why do we come together as a crowd, as a group to worship? And prepare your hearts for that. Think of the things you have to be grateful for and thankful for. There's so much that can bring us to praise and worship God. So I encourage you to do that the way that scripture calls us to praise. And then we see that Jesus is worthy. And if you're looking in your books, the scripture for that is on page 43. <clears throat> And on page 43, we see our friends, the Pharisees, and they're being Pharisees. With all the celebration going on, it says in verse 39, some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And that was not just the apostles. That was anybody that was learning from Jesus. That was referring to the crowd. We are disciples. And it says, he answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. When I'm teaching children's choir, I refer to that verse a lot. That I don't want a stone taken my place. <laughs> I want to be the one that cries out. I want to be the one that sings praise. And I want to do it the best I can because I don't want a stone taken my place. And so that's the way, and they'll, 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 of course, and I'll, I'll let them know where that comes from. Don't get me wrong. I'll let them know it's not my thought, but it's really, really here that it's in Scripture. Don't let a stone take your place. God doesn't care what your voice is like. My father had a tin ear, I suppose. He couldn't carry a tune anywhere. It just couldn't, but he loved to sing. And during worship, for a musician that he had paid to train as a musician sitting next to that, and my mother's voice wasn't a whole lot better, I can remember as a kid just kind of cringing. But they didn't hold back. They praised God anyway. He doesn't really care. And so if you sit there and you don't, or stand there and you don't sing because you think you don't have a good voice, who gave you that voice? God gave you that voice. And so use it. Use it to praise him. Use it to worship him. As you get into, and, and it'll feel awkward if you're not used to just going ahead and singing out. It'll feel kind of awkward at first. But if you will do that, and maybe I'm speaking from a musician's heart, but as you begin to sing the worst, the words of the hymns, you'll recall scripture that those hymns are based on. And as you sing the praise and worship music, it's the same. And we always, I, I feel like Enterprise does a good job of blending those. So at some places, there's always that tension between are we going to have the traditional hymns or are we going to have the praise and worship music? Well, actually, if you look at most of the praise and worship music, it's directly out of scripture. You can find it almost word for word. And those words will start to speak to you as you sing them, not just as you hear them, but as you really sing them. And you'll find yourself truly worshiping. So I challenge you to, well, let's say give it a couple of months. It's not going to happen overnight. But really put effort into it for a couple of months and see if you don't feel different about the worship of, through music. We also worship or can worship as we're listening to sermons. 
And as we're listening, and I, I think that I will speak for Chris here, if we respond to what's being said, it helps him to worship in the delivery of the sermon. I don't think he minds us saying amen every now and then. And I'm quite sure he doesn't mind seeing you smile or seeing you nod when you're understanding or seeing some response from you. And that's part of your worship while you're here. And we see the crowds were worshiping. The Pharisees refused to. They hardened their hearts and they wouldn't participate in any way. Don't be that Pharisee. Don't sit there listening to the people around you and thinking, whoa, they really shouldn't be singing. Or why are we singing that hymn again? Or, well, there goes Chris again. Don't, you know, or looking at your watch, how quickly can we be through here? Don't be that person during the time that you're here. Get into worship. Enjoy the time that you're here. Worship God. That's what he wants us to do. He wants, he is pleased by us, and we want to be pleased in him. So, that's about the praise. And... Uh, about that he is worthy and let me find my place okay I'm there so that's our scripture for today now what I want to do with the remaining time is to talk about what lessons we do learn from that donkey and to think about that because we can learn from the donkey and there are things we can do this week every week that the donkey did First of all, I didn't had never really connected this. The firstborn donkey had to be redeemed by a lamb. If you were to look back in Exodus 13, 13, it says, redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. That was part of the, the ritual of the firstborn sons of humans, the firstborn sons of all of the different animals had to be redeemed. But the donkey is mentioned by name. Um, of course, part of that is because the donkey was a work animal and they needed a way to keep those animals to do what they needed to do. It is repeated in Exodus 34. <laughs> The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, said God, including all the firstborn males of the, your livestock, whether from herd or flock. But it mentions in particular, redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. No one is to appear, appear before me empty-handed. So the donkey at least if it was the firstborn donkey, had been redeemed. It is the only unclean animal that's listed in these things, that is listed by name and to be redeemed. To me, there's an image there. We are unclean animals, if you want to say that. We are unclean beings, and we need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, as well and so are you redeemed by the blood of the lamb because God wants to cleanse you he wants to do that in Ephesians 1 7 it says in him we have redemption through the, his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace um, in Revelation it mentions redemption a lot so have you been redeemed like the donkey. That would be the first thing to consider. Do you know other people that need to be redeemed by the blood of the lamb who, are, who need that? And are you talking to them? Are you at least praying for them? Are you actively seeking to help them understand how be, to be redeemed by the blood of the lamb? The second lesson I see that we can learn is that the donkey had to be untied to be useful. Remember that donkey was tied up. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't move. He couldn't do what Jesus wanted him to do if he was left there tied up. And so what's tying you up 
what's keeping you from doing what Jesus wants you to do. Are you believing lies? And sometimes, or are you influenced by lies? Are there prejudices that you hold against other people? Are there fears that you have? And here's one that gets most of us. Are you just too busy? Are you tied up in all the busyness of what you do? Are you letting your age tie you up? Well, I'm just too old to help in vacation Bible school. I'm just too old to teach Sunday school. I'm just too old. Or maybe I'm just right in the middle and there's just too much going on. When I get past all of this middle age stuff of having kids and having parents and all of the work and all of that, then I'll serve God. Are you just too young? I don't know enough. I haven't had enough experience. I don't know what's going on. Those things can tie us up, and it goes throughout our whole life if we let it. I think that's a lesson that God taught me early, and I'm so glad he did. And that is that whenever I'm asked to do something for him, unless it's just something I'm really uncomfortable with, I'll say yes. Because I learned as I did that, that God provided what I needed. Just like he, in our lesson, was providing what people needed to worship. That he provides what you need to be able to do what he's calling you to do. Do you have habits that are holding you back? Habits that are tying you up? Things that you need to let go of? There are all sorts of ways we can be tied up. But scripture tells us this, in John 8, 32, Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And a little bit later in that same chapter, in 8, 36, it says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Even back in Psalm 119, verse 45, it says, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. The precepts, of course, are the word of God. All of 119 is about the word of God. So we walk about in freedom because we know those things. So there are so many ways that he sets us free and acts another verse. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. And Romans 8 says, There's, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You are free. Start living that way. Untie those chains that are holding you or the ropes that are holding you and live in freedom. We can also see that the donkey was waiting to be used by Jesus. Maybe that's a little bit of a stretch. But we're going to go say that one anyway. He was waiting. He was there. He hadn't been used for anything yet. And so he, there was a period of waiting. And certainly we have to wait sometimes on God. There are all sorts of Bible verses about waiting. But he was willing when the time came to do what God wanted him to do. So he was willing to wait until God called him. Um, in, in BSF leadership, about this time of the year, they're asking us to commit to whether we're going to lead again or not. And one of the things that we are always told is, if you have a clear calling to go into another ministry, you'll go with our blessing. But if you don't have that clear call, stay right where you are, doing what you're doing faithfully until there is something else that God calls you to do. Many of us can be there of waiting 
for God to call us out. But when he calls, are we willing? And I think that for Christians, that can sometimes be the hardest thing. So I'm going to give you one verse for that. And that's to look at Psalm 51, verse 12. And it says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Pray. Ask God to make you willing. Sometimes whenever you find yourself just wanting to say no to every opportunity that comes to share the gospel or to do something to allow, allow others to share the gospel or whatever the task may be and you just want to say no, 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 it's time to get on your knees and pray for God to give you a willing spirit. The fourth lesson that I see is that, donkey, that the donkey served Jesus. I've already mentioned what a strange situation that would have been for that donkey. How uncomfortable it would have been for that donkey to go through that crowd when he had never even been ridden before. He had to be fearful. He had to be anxious. He had to have questions about whether that was there was any safety in what he was doing or not. What about you? Are you anxious about something that God wants you to do? Are you fearful going into a new situation that God puts you in? Are you fearful of strange situations? Greg will tell you I am. In human type situations, I'm very much fearful of um, things that my kids rock climb and go off the edges of cliffs and it makes me fearful just thinking about it. I have that in my spirit is to be fearful. But the donkey overcame it. Can you overcome your fear to serve God? It doesn't matter if you go over the side of a cliff or not. But can you overcome your fears to serve God? Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I've read that the problem with offering yourself as a living sacrifice is living sacrifices tend to crawl right off that altar and you've got to crawl right back up on it again. It's, it's something that you do over and over is coming to God and saying, here, use me. Let me do your work. Romans 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. John 13, this is part of what happened during Holy Week. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Psalm 119 again, in one verse 112, my heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. We have to decide, to set our heart, <coughs> to decide that we are going to do it. It's, a, it, it's not something that just comes necessarily easily. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So are you willingly serving Jesus, serving God? May we do as well as the donkey did. And then... The donkey, there's one donkey, not this donkey in this story, but there's one donkey in the Bible, one donkey in all of history as far as we know, that talked. Do you remember Balaam's donkey? In Numbers 22, Balaam kept trying to go where God didn't want him to do, go, and the donkey wouldn't go, and the donkey wouldn't go, and he wouldn't go, until finally Balaam beat the donkey. And then... He saw what the donkey had seen all along, and that was that the angel of the Lord was blocking the way, wasn't allowing them to go that way. 
The angel, this is in Numbers 22, the angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I've come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared the donkey. <laughs> and remember before that, the donkey had questioned him of, I've been good all these years. I've been that faithful, steady donkey. Why are you beating me now? Can't you figure out something's going on? And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. The donkey was wise. The time that he spoke, he spoke in wisdom. And so what is your language like? What are your words like? Are you careful to be sure that they are wise words? Are you careful to be sure that they are lifting others up? Are you careful of the way you talk? The Balaam's donkey was. He was careful to respond to God. And so in Colossians 4, 6, you know there are a lot of verses about speech. In that for Colossians 4, 6, 6, it says, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you re should respond to each person. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And the psalmist said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. And that's Psalm 39, 1. So are you guarding your speech? Are you being careful of the way you talk? Balaam's donkey had to be, of course, because God put the words in his mouth. And then the sixth lesson I see that we can, and this is the final one, that really and truly was another surprise to me. Did you know that donkeys carry a cross on their back? You can look it up. Google the donkey's cross. Every donkey, it doesn't matter what color they are, has a line straight down their back from their head to their tail and a cross one across their shoulders. I never, if I'd heard that, I'd forgotten it. The darker donkeys, you don't see it easily, but the light colored ones you do, and you can look it up. Just Google it, and it's right there. Now, there are all sorts of reasons that scientists will explain that, but we're going to use it as an example. It, it, it's a lot like the zebra stripes. It makes it a little harder to see in bushes and shrubs and things like that. There is also, though, a... a, a fable or a story that has been told about that and that is that and this is not in the bible but it's still a sweet story to think about is that there was a donkey that this same donkey followed jesus to the cross and when the shadow of the cross fell on his back he was left with the mark of the cross and i just think that's kind of a sweet nothing biblical about it but it, it's a sweet type of story to think about so, but the donkey is carrying a cross, and you know where that leads. What about you? Do you take up your cross every day and follow Christ? In Luke 9, just a couple of chapters before where, or a few chapters before where we are today in Luke 19, verses 23 through 26, Jesus had told them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. 
But it's good of Jesus also to tell us that taking up that cross sounds real heavy. And it sounds like I'm not sure I'm ready for that job. <coughs> but it was good of Jesus to also say after that, come to me. And this is from Matthew 11, 18, 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <coughs> Paul adds, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, six lessons from the donkey. First of all, redemption. That we need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Secondly, we have to be loosened for our for us to be useful to God, to serve him, we have to be untied. Third, we have to be waiting and willing to be used by God. Fourth, we have to be willing to serve Jesus, even in strange situations. Fifth, we have to speak wisely as we're doing those things, carefully, with gracious speech. And finally, we have to be willing to carry the cross. Jesus said it. We have to be willing to live with the discomfort of whatever your cross may be and still serve him. So, we are called to worship today. We are called to worship through obedience. We are called to worship through our words and through our actions. And so I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to do it as well as the donkey in our story did. I read this at the beginning of the lesson. I'm going to read it again. Isaiah 55, 12 says, You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. And there is a song, we don't have this hymn, called There's a Man Riding In on a Donkey. Actually, I couldn't find a hymn in the Baptist hymnal about donkeys. We must have gotten above our raising to not be willing to sing about donkeys because there are hymns in the Presbyterian hymnal and the Methodist hymnal and some other hymnals about the donkey. But this poem says, There's a man riding in on a donkey. There's a man and they say he's a king. And the palm leaves are waving a welcome and the voices of the people sing Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Why a king riding in on a donkey? Why a king wearing no fine crown? Where are the drums? Where are the high-sounding cymbals? If a king is riding into town, <clears throat> sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Hear the voice of the king on a donkey. Hear the joy of the news he brings. He is Jesus, the son of the highest. He is Jesus and the king of kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the king of kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the king. Let your praises be heard by God. And I want us to pray. We have so many prayer needs. I know that you all have gotten emails during the week about several of those. I encourage you to keep a list to pray for those people. Um, and let's, let's just lift them up. I'm sure that many of you have needs that I don't know of. But again, I have trouble hearing to repeat that. So just keep us aware of your prayer needs. Okay, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, give us willing hearts. Give us hearts that will praise you with our voices and praise you, with our actions that will serve you, that will follow you. And I thank you for the lessons I've learned from this donkey this week. It's been a fun one. It's been one that I've been able to share with um, some of my children that are not close to you. And um, that, that has been a fun experience too. And I thank you for, for those lessons. And I hope that these people have, have 
learned lessons also from that donkey. And dear God, we lift up the many needs in our church. We pray for Michael's continued healing and that he will be back with us soon and just give you the praise for how um, the medical treatment is working and how he is going to be able to um, resume a normal life as long as things continue the way they are now. And we pray for those that we know are sick, <laughs> that have special needs in our congregation. They've been mentioned. Their prayers have come to you. And we lift them up to you for healing, for your presence to be with them if they are in difficult circumstances. And we just pray that during this week, as we walk through this week, that we will keep you on our mind and in our heart as we go through the Holy Week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs>